Could I ask you all to raise your feet and give a big startup round of welcome to John Wheeler. It's like Tom Cruise. <laughs> I'm going to come out, I'm going to start it's hopping up and down. <laughs> you warned me, you didn't tell me that was going to happen. Uh, Rockstar, welcome. <laughs> um, so, John, you're very welcome. What I forgot to say with all your, your uh, various hats is that you're a native Limerick person. Oh, yeah. which, is the, which is the main thing. Oh, yeah, that's very important. Very important. Yeah. <laughs> so, before we start talking about your role uh, running the Accelerator program and speaking before that about the four startups you were involved in, can you just give us a bit of background, your personal background? Um, did you come from a family with sort of an entrepreneur uh, gene in the family, or what got you into the whole startup entrepreneurship world? Yeah, uh, uh, well, first of all, thanks, geez, thanks for asking me, and thanks everybody for coming. And, I'm delighted to be here and I mean I noticed in the introduction you said people who've had successful startups and are involved in the community I think it's more the latter the successful startups maybe weren't so <laughs> successful but that's it that could be a useful thing but yeah if, I mean well, my background my family but no, I think it is very important the entrepreneurship thing in your family can be uh, like my my family people who are here from Killaloo <laughs> And that and I know that there is an entrepreneurial <coughs> side in the, so the Whelans in Killaloo. And my father always wanted to be an entrepreneur, but my mother wouldn't let him. But when he retired, <laughs> when he retired, thank God they're not here. Yeah. Uh, when he retired, though, he did put a lot of money into a business and he lost it all. And it was tough to see, you know, in those days in the 80s, uh, it was tough to see, you know. And I've, I think at the back of my mind it was kind of a thing, yeah, yeah, we'd like to prove that you could do it for I I think there's a lot of room for research to look at family backgrounds for entrepreneurs. Yeah. Okay. It's not saying that necessarily successful or not, but that's another thing, yeah. So where did your sort of career start then? I mean, well, I, would, I mean my life isn't so interesting, but since you ask, <laughs> how much time have you got? <laughs> Forty-five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember when I was four. No. <laughs> the three-legged. Right? No, no. I went to did the usual thing. Went to Sexton Street in Limerick. Uh, went to Moline. Went to college. I would have. UL wasn't a university then. And actually, that that brings up a very important point. I think that I think there's a real tragedy in Irish society at the moment for young kids going into college. And I work in a university now. And my own kids, because we live in Dublin now. They're all going to college in Dublin, so they're losing that getting away from home, and they're driving us nuts, and we're driving them nuts, and it's wrong. I mean, I know Graham, your your kids are in Dublin. That's great. I was, we were encouraging them to go, to go to Galway, go to go to Cork, go to. I mean, financially, make. I think that's a real problem in Ireland. You know, if you look at the CAO results, you see, you know, when they bring out the school rankings, they show where the school. So the school in Tralee, ninety percent of the kids go to tech. Tree Institute of Technology, you know, and that, that's not what university education is about. Sorry, I've gone off on a tangent. You have to watch me for a while. <laughs> bring me back. I can't even remember. What <laughs> <laughs> that's I have a real problem for that. Okay. Yeah. You, you can't remember what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, oh yeah, no, I went to college. Oh jeez, went to college, uh, did physics, and no interest. The only entrepreneurship we saw at college then was, I remember Michael Smurfett came to give a talk, and I remember being inspired by that. It was organized by some business society. I was doing physics, but I went along for some reason. There must have been free pizza. Mm -hmm. But it, it kind of struck a chord. But then I did a PhD uh, in physics, stayed in Galway. I had to get the Galway thing out of your system that you have to do. Um, and then I got a job in as a coder, coding. Late 80s, weren't too many jobs. Delighted to get a job. Worked in Davy Stockbrokers as the software guy. Then worked in a lot of small, a lot of Irish software. FinTech, did we call it FinTech now? Nobody knew what FinTech was then. Before it happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
maybe it's still you know, maybe it's getting out of fashion now. We could talk. That's another controversial. <laughs> but uh, anyway, she's, I can see John. They're gonna be difficult. <laughs> <laughs> but to make it short, worked with a few. The companies get kept getting smaller and smaller, um, and then I, I met a few. We I worked with the first ever internet bank that was set up in Dublin, in the dot com bubble. And met a few guys there who were from Limerick, two guys from Limerick by coincidence. Never knew them in Limerick. And then we decided to form our own business and we left and formed one company and raised a few bob angel investment. Then one of the guys had an idea in a bath in Vienna, as I was talking to her, <laughs> Valerie's husband. <laughs> True story. Genuinely came, had a very good idea, woke up in the morning about doing exchange betting. Got the whole idea, and this was the time of, you know, the internet was just becoming mainstream, to 1998, maybe 99. Uh, this was real. This internet stuff wasn't going away, and you know, he said, "Why don't we? Why can't you exchange bets online? You know, like eBay for bets." And we, I remember saying, "That is a good idea," and we just put together a business plan. Went around Dublin. Uh, looking for an investment, talking to everybody. I remember in particular going to Paddy Power at the time. Uh, Stuart Kenny, who was the MD of Paddy Power at the time, he saw what we were doing and we showed him what we were doing and he said, yeah, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. go away, let's see it. You know, you know, he just didn't get it. You know, like I know Paddy Power eventually, as you know, now merged with Betfair, who were doing the exact same thing. So we were doing the same, same idea as Betfair. So we went to London, we said, look, we'll give up, we'll go to London for two weeks. Raised, in, within two weeks in London, we had two offers of over a million pounds sterling, which was a good bid in those days, not so much now. And, you know, we were, had two investors bidding against each other. So, you know, then that took off, but then we raised the money, then the dot-com bubble burst. And we kind of, some of the guys left, Barry went off to travel the world. <laughs> And become a trader with Merrill Lynch and Credit Suisse. He now is a lecturer in UL, actually. Uh, Finbar Murphy, good guy. God bless him. Um, but then one of the guys that was working with us, we stayed behind. We started doing consultancy, and then got the idea. Well, if we do consultancy for a while, we might see an idea. You know, if you're working as a consultant, people are paying for it. And then we got into mobile. Started doing mobile gambling consultancy and then got into picture messaging. So formed another company and raised more money. Raised about the same. Just back yeah. on a second. So you raised a million through like a VC, was it? Yeah, yeah, to, uh, yeah, London. Yeah. So a VC takes a punt yeah. for a certain amount of equity. Yeah. And then if it doesn't work out, it's hard luck for them. And in this case, it didn't. So what did you put the million into? Yeah, we, we, the money was just purely in the business plan to develop the product and launch the product, and we did launch it. I mean, we had about 15 people launched it. Uh, then the bubble, you know, when the bubble burst, when the psychology goes against it, it was phenomenal how, you know, then they started asking, what are your revenues? Like, and our revenues were like 30 pounds, so it was pounds, literally 30 pounds a month. But, but the money was going into scaling it. Yeah, but the money was there, like people were lodging. I remember I had it set up that I could get a text whenever somebody lodged money. And I remember a guy lodged 2,000 pounds sterling into our system, and we never didn't know who he was. He wasn't a friend of a friend. It's, you know, that's a viable business. If somebody's going to lodge two thousand into your system, there's some value there somewhere. Now, but then we, you know, we had to create liquidity as an exchange market. But the bubble burst, and Betfair had come along with twenty million in funding against our one million. And you know, it's all that. It's all time and time. time. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and you know. Maybe we should have stuck at it, you know? Okay, so you, the consultancy then was the next step? Yeah, and then, and then we got into the whole picture messaging. You know, 3G was going to be huge. Everybody was going to be doing 3G. And now we all have it, but again, the timing, you know, the Gartner hype cycle is a thing, you know, in market re or technology research, it's so important. Where it is, everything has the, you know, there's a huge hype about something in any technology. It starts off and then it goes to the peak of expect inflated expectations and then it goes down into the trough of disillusionment and then it comes out into the you know real markets and you know you just have to be catch it at the right time just coming out of the, the trough is usually the best time uh, yeah. so you got a, a baptism of fire in the startup world 
Yeah, yeah, but we weren't, we never had an, I mean, like you've had people speaking here who have had successful right. exits. We never had an exit, but that company, Alato Technologies, it kept going for eight, seven or eight years. It employed 10, 15 people. We got into Vodafone. Uh, you know, MMS didn't take off. Remember MMS, you know, it mm -hmm. was, but you know, the, the mobile operators, the mobile network operators, they had an opportunity there and they blew it. You know, they, they didn't charge for it properly. You had to pay. If you were sending a picture from Vodafone to O2, you couldn't do it or it was going to cost you a pound or a euro. The, you know, it was, don't blame the operators, but they, it, was, it was at the peak of inflated expectations. And uh, yeah, we, so we, learned, we learned a lot. If you want to, uh, the reason why we didn't succeed in that company to have an exit was we, we got Vodafone, we got O2 Ireland. And they're good, it's really hard to get in. You know, it's enterprise sales. So to get into one of those kind of organizations, takes you a year but once you're in you're in for five years because they can't kick you out because you come part of the IT infrastructure and change management so if we take that out that could break something or there's some customers using it so you know it's a, it's a good business model enterprise sales but the, this life cycle the sales cycle is so long but we but, uh, we tried to get the third customer and we very nearly got orange Belgium like Two interesting stories, maybe. I mean, like, you know, because it, the third sale is with, outside of Ireland. Orange Belgium had an RFQ, you know, request for a quote, request for a proposal, RFPs and enterprise sales. Are they still around? People still use yeah. them? Yeah, just, uh, I'm so long out of it. I don't know if people use them. But Orange Belgium were interested. We had a good product and they came to visit us. And I. I remember we got together, we said, okay, we've got to look like a big company. So we hired a lot of students to sit at desks and tell it <laughs> and gave them computers and gave them books on Java to be looking at. <laughs> uh, genuinely true. Uh, and we were subletting from another company and we had you know, the reception geared up to say, yes, welcome to Alata Technologies, where she had like two other companies. But, but you know, what, even, so we looked like we had 50 people. But even then, from talking to them, 50 people wasn't enough. They wanted you to have 500, 5,000 people. You know, so you were never going to win at that enterprise sales level. The other one we nearly got was Vodafone Greece. And we were over in Greece, and the haggling, the sales guy that was with us was fantastic. Great guy, Kevin. Uh, he, he was walking out the door literally with the with his briefcase. I'm going to the airport. You know, it was really this level of hacking. You know, with, you know, it was a cultural. You know, Irish people I think are great when we try travel and do business. We can morph. If you want us to be the German straight up, or you want us to be the American guy, or you want us to be the Irish guy whining and dining, you we can be whatever you you want to be. I think that's a great skill. And people don't know what we're supposed to be like. <laughs> so how do, how do you do business with these Irish people? You know, men or women, how, how do you deal with them? We don't know, but you know, there's no book, how to do business with the Irish. I haven't thought about that. There's not choosing. I haven't thought about writing the book. social thing. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, we, we did the deal with them. We came away from the airport saying, God, we've got them in the bag. And then, then next, next week, Vodafone took over. It wasn't Vodafone Greece at that time, it was Panafon Greece. And you know, Vodafone were acquiring all over Europe. So then we didn't get the, didn't get the third customer and kind of then started looking at new products and you know innovating. Um, but it was it was good. It was I mean it did keep going for seven years, but uh, never had an exit. But we paid all our creditors and and you know when you're closing down a company, that's the big thing. It's so expensive to close down a company if you've been trading that long. I think it cost us about fifty thousand to close down. So we had a good board, you know, to keep the keep the that amount of money always in the bank because vcs when vcs are on your board they're always going to be conscious they're directors of multiple companies and they will do it squeaky clean and they're right and irish company law is very strong and correctly so and it, it's it's good so do you want to just explain the vc model to maybe some people that aren't familiar with how that works Jesus, that's <laughs> that's a one-on-one yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean it, yeah, i think the best way yeah vc it's risk money. People want to have, you know, you put your money on deposit in the bank, you get great rates from Bank of Ireland. Bank of Ireland sponsor us in Launchbox and Dublin, two great sponsors. 
genuinely love working with Bank of Ireland. People-wise, great people. I didn't ask him to say that. No, genuinely, <laughs> it's it's a unique thing that's uh, culturally getting on so well. But the VC model is high risk money, so they'll raise a fund. There's a big thing if you want to get, you hear of GPs and LPs, general partner and limited partner. That's a real good buzzword to drop when you're talking about VCs. You have to know what a GP is and an LP is. And you know, I can't remember which is which. <laughs> but one is the one that gives the money uh, to, the, the, to the limited partner. I can't remember, one of them gives 100 million to a fund, or say, say 10 million. So here's 10 million, high risk money to invest. So they invest, one million in ten companies, but they only need to get a return in one or two of them. And if they get a good return, scalable return, if they make twenty million in, in one and an exit, well, they double their money. So it is; they are prepared to lose their money. It's great. I mean, that's the it's fantastic the way that whole mechanism has evolved. And Ireland is, you know, for early stage investment, Ireland has huge opportunities. Angel investors are the kind of earlier. As we know, I'm sure most people 30, know. 30, 40,000 kind of level, right? Yeah, yeah. And that can be, that can be more problematic if, if they're in a, in a syndicate. There's very good syndicates in Ireland, you know, H-BAN, syndicates of investors. But if you, you know, you'll meet lots of angel investors that will offer you, like the first money we got for, for the first company was from an angel investor, but we knew it was tr throwaway money. But if you have somebody that's given you their life savings, and sometimes that happens, or their pension, Pot, you know, that's really obviously very dodgy and coach, you know, ethically dodgy for them to un understand the risk and they don't understand the risk, and, you know. So but ask me more about the university stuff because yeah. I'm not an expert in this stuff yeah. because I think that's, well, I'm not I'm saying what to ask. No, no. So, so your, the experience out of the startups must have, be, must have given you a good ground in getting into technology transfer and then ultimately yeah. the accelerator. So, can you just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then I saw a job <laughs> advertised in. in the, Newspapers still, the jobs used to be advertised in newspapers on a Friday in the Irish Times. Remember that, Graham? Yeah. CPI would have a big whole page. Their own newspaper, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it, they, they, uh, so there was a, a job I just threw for technology transfer, and Ireland was only starting. The universities, this was 2007, and Ireland had no, technology transfer hadn't existed in Irish universities at that time. Now every Irish university and institute of technology, Paul Dillon runs it out in UL, um, has funded by Enterprise Ireland based on the model, the United States has been doing it for 20, 30 years, that there's a, a single place where you can go and collaborate with a university uh, to try and either license technologies that they've already developed or uh, bring an idea, say I've, I've got an idea of a problem that that I think has legs and, and work with them. So this has only been set up. So there was nobody that they could hire that knew, knew the business, you know. So I didn't know even what technology transfer was, but the requirements were like, you know, knowledge of innovation and startups. So I was lucky to, to get in, you know, uni uh, university application uh, interviewing system is weird. You know, you have seven people on a panel for an hour and they all ask you questions and then they go, that's it. So then they make you an offer. You know. Is it generally sort of monetizing research projects from other universities? Yeah, it's, it's, we're now in the, it's interesting, the we're in the third phase of funding now in Ireland for technology transfer. It's called Technology Transfer Strengthening Initiative, or TTSI for short, but it's, it's about 30 or 40 million a year that the Department of Jobs, Education and, and Innovation, DEGI, whatever they're called, and uh, it's evolved, like in each phase it's evolved, and now it's much more about collaboration because in the beginning it's all about if you build it, it's like field of dreams, if you build it, they will come. So all the uni researchers are working away on these really great things, really cool things, and, and they're just thinking there'll be a market for it. And there might not be, but it's much more important if a company can come along. And it, now this tends to be the bigger companies, the multinationals who will come along and say, well, we've, you know, we're interested in getting into artificial intelligence or whatever, and they'll collaborate with experts in the field in the university, and there's a, a deal done that any outputs are shared, but they'll contribute some of the money towards it. But the government, Science Foundation Ireland in particular, and Enterprise Ireland will add to that. So you can leverage up uh, the money. For smaller companies, it's a bit, there are, there are different 
schemes, it's a bit different, but does the innovation vouchers for any limited company, if you're a limited company, does a call open at the moment for the innovation vouchers? Uh, I was talking to a chap back there earlier, and he said he's got his whole uh, system developed on it, but it's only 5,000 euro, but you get it. 90% of them are funded. The application is one page. The problem with them is getting a educational partner to develop them for you, because 5,000 is small. But we've had companies that have grown from scratch from innovation vouchers. Um, and yeah, you have some of the idea if anyone wants to speak to them about it right. afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's there's the innovation partnership, which is the which is a, a good <laughs> opportunity where the enterprise where the company only has to put up depends, you know, there's 50 to 30, 40, 50 percent of the funding and Enterprise Ireland will put up the rest. You have to be so careful of state aid rules uh, that Enterprise Ireland would love to help everybody directly, but they can't because of, it's anti-competitive. So uh, an example locally of, uh, in UL, a company like about technology transfer would be Stokes Bio, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. What was their journey, you know? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know them that well, actually. I know it's hugely successful yeah. and, uh, in the UL. Might be an example of a trinity. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the big, the big project that I was involved in in Trinity that actually I'm most proud of uh, was a project with Google where actually a company wasn't even formed. So Enterprise Ireland had funded the research and it was about audio, immersive audio technology. Um, Katrina there was involved in the early days as a consultant from, from uh, Montana Marketing, it was brilliant. She, she went all, went, you know, these guys had this uh, 3D audio, basically the fact that if you're listening to audio for in games or movies, everybody thinks about the, the screen and the visual content, but audio content is so important. So to, if you're playing a game and you turn your head and somebody's shooting you, you have, the sound has to move between, the, between the, your headphones to make it seem real. So you can locate where they are, they're behind you, they're above you. That's quite hard to do, but these, engineers at Trinity have been working on this for years. Enterprise Ireland funded it under the commercialization fund. So Katrina and I, our job was to uh, commercial, you know, try to bring this to market. And we were trying to help them form a company, but they had some contacts in Google um, in San Francisco. And Google suddenly got very interested and wanted, turned out they just said, look, we want to buy, we want to buy this lock, stock and barrel, but we also want to hire the developers, the, the students, there were PhDs, there was one, two PhD students, one master's student and one postdoc. And they all had to go to San Francisco, do interviews and be hired by Google. It was like acqui hire, you know, acquisition and hire, which is often why big corporates buy companies. It's not just for the necessarily the technology or the customers, it's the people. So they got four really good engineers and uh, they paid Trinity directly for the rights and there were three patents involved. But that was that was millions, that was a quite a significant amount. It's like a soccer transfer. Yeah, 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 yeah. well, yeah, I wasn't quite, this, maybe a league of Ireland, no, <laughs> no, 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 a bit more than that. But, uh, but it was, yeah, that was, but the, the interesting thing was the company wasn't formed, if they, they still get half, this is what a lot of researchers don't realize, they still got half the money for themselves personally. So bank manager rang me up afterwards because the guys were buying houses. These, they sorry, did turn out they were all guys because they were engineers. That's just the way, that's where I was very, it's important. In electronic engineering, just happened they were four. But anyway, I could talk about that story because okay. they didn't have time to form the company. If they'd formed the company, they would have got 95% of it. But they still got 50% of it within the university system as cash to themselves. So it was a good deal for everybody. I presume they got some equity going forward in the company with Google. No, no, no. no, no. Well, they got share options. They share got their options. normal options, but they got their employee okay. options. I, don't know. I think they got generous options. So can yeah. you can we just move on then to Blackstone um, yeah. Accelerator? Can you tell us a bit about Blackstone and how the Accelerator yeah. model works? Yeah. Um, well, it started the whole Accelerator thing in Trinity. Then started when I was in Tech Transfer. That some angel, well, some Trinity people like Brian Caulfield and people who had su had successful exits, he now works in a VC. Might be the guest here. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. He's, he's a more impressive guy than me now. <laughs> he's a serious guy. But he, uh, 
he had the idea with a few others that we should set up a student accelerator to support student entrepreneurs because Trinity always has, and all universities always have people coming that succeed, that you know, graduate and do their own companies when they're in college. Sean Blanchfield, he put in some money as well. He found Demon Ware when he was a student, or even dropped out of college. That film, Mar Mark Zuckerberg movie, has a lot got to do with it sometimes, but it's made the culture seem attainable to younger people. And Trinity said, uh, well, Trinity took their money, so about 10 of them got together and decided to fund an accelerator for the summer that they would give Trinity students five or 10,000 each company to work on their business. So that was five years ago now, and that's, that's gone from strength to strength. In the, a few of them have been in startup grind in Dublin, Artematics, who raised 2.2 million. They were, they were in the first year of the program. Food Cloud, I don't know if you, if you know Food Cloud, they sold the word. They were, we were the first people to support them. So I set that up in Trinity and uh, learned as we go along, you know, just kind of broke all the rules. And the whole accelerator thing is, yeah, I mean, I think the, the big thing about accelerator is you have to stand back, you know, you have to let people do their stuff. You don't want it to be rigorous, you don't want it to be a program, but universities have a big problem with that. And that's, it's become a bit like that now in that, you know, there's, there's a program of, you know, be here on this day for this workshop and do your lean canvas and all that. But they're all at different stages, so some people need different help. help. But the key thing we used to do was just introduce them to the network. That's the key thing. This, this student would be in a business and say, we know somebody, or the Bank of Ireland knows somebody that can help you, that's all. Matching. Yeah, yeah. Just take the example of, of Food Cloud, it's a great story. From, from day one when you met them to where they are now, you just really run through yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, don't know what. When we, when we met them, they were like, they were young, like they were business students, like Graham's daughter's doing business in Trinity. me nuts. <laughs> but, uh, but they had a real vision, you know, they were really, like young, young people like that are really, what's the word, idealistic. And I, I love working with them because they believe they can do anything. And, and, you know, and they don't know how, how hard it is. Like the naivety is brilliant. I mean, that naivety is a negative word, it's brilliant. We had a team, a team of guys this year working on a problem and a, you, know, you introduced them to a, a lecturer who's been researching that problem for 20 years. He says, you can't do it, I've been working on it for 20 years. And he said to me afterwards, he said, I haven't looked at it, you know? I haven't tried. And then sometimes the technology just moves on and somebody makes a breakthrough. And, but Food Cloud were like that. They had this great vision and they were, they were great in you know, the leadership quality. You saw it, there was about six or seven of them. And we only funded three of them, but they distributed the money amongst themselves. They were always coming in, coming out. They were really, really, uh, they were taught to everybody. They were, uh, you know, that's the key thing we always say, get out and talk to people, you know, the usual thing. I know what they're doing now, but was that the original yeah, problem I mean, they were solving? Yeah, the idea was the same. No, they had, it wasn't an original idea. They were first to say they'd seen it in New York somewhere. And they were actually using a software platform from New York, from somebody that they'd licensed in from New York. I think they developed their own software afterwards. So the idea wasn't unique, um, but they just implemented it so well. And, but, you know, their ability as people to talk to people, you know, uh, and just work the, work the relationships, work the network. And so what's your criteria for choosing the people on the program initially? Yeah, it's a very, it's, it's a very good question. It's very hard. We make mistakes all the time, all the time. And, you know, once you get people in, within a week you can say, we were wrong there. Because uh, people are great, uh, particularly students, are brilliant at gaming the system, you know. It's a system, and you can't game entrepreneurship, you know. Like, entrepreneurship is about getting customers our <coughs> revenues, our investments, or to put bread and milk on the table. Whereas, you know, exams, so they've all gone through the Irish exam system, and so they know, the smart ones, we try to, I try to filter these people out, they know that, if I put entrepreneurship on my resume and I go, it's going to look good when I apply to Accenture or PwC or Google even, and, and uh, they're just box ticking. So we make mistakes like that. And you know, pitching is a real problem. So many people are, particularly young students nowadays, are they're in debating societies and they're really confident and they're they're brilliant pitchers. They pitch and they're brilliant salespeople, but. They can sometimes there's a lack of substance behind it or a lack of perseverance or ability to deliver 
Um, so so we you're, you're filtering out the people that are just doing it for their CV. Yeah, but we try to, but we don't always do it. You're also yeah. careful that the ones that are good pitchers might have a good idea. Yeah, yeah. How important is that balance then between the idea, the execution, and the team? Yeah, I mean, they're the, the three T's. Like where we, I remember Steve Collins, who founded Havoc out of Trinity, and uh, now is Swerve. Well, he's left Swerve, and now he's in Frontline Ventures, which are great. Frontline Ventures are a great PC. They really get web stuff, you know. They're young people like Steve. Just, um, but uh, what was the question again? Sorry, <laughs> I keep coming off of. How important are the three sorry. IT execution? Oh yeah, and, and yeah. Why, why, so Steve has a, a slide that he puts up, um, and this is kind of for tech startups. But it implies he said your probability of success. Like he's an engineer, so he does it like his probability of success equals t one t to the power of one, which is technology, plus t to the power of two, which is uh, traction, which is customers, any traction, and, and t to the power of three, which is team. Team is the most important thing. You know, I borrowed that from him, but I mean, I'm sure he probably got it somewhere else. But I mean, now that applies for tech startups, but maybe t could be idea. You know, idea, I, I mean, the classic one that everybody, Guy Kawasaki, from uh, early founder of Apple and his, you know ideas. We had this up in a huge poster in Launchbox the first year, uh, and a vinyl poster, and it was ideas are easy, implementation is hard. Uh, it's simple as simple as that. And who's who's going to implement the idea? There's a website that you can go to that has a thousand ideas listed, just to show how ideas are. Um, it's kind of sixweekmba.com and it lists a thousand ideas and you know, you read them and they're actually pretty good ideas. When you read them, you say, that is a good idea. But they just list them to show how, how, how cheap ideas are. You know? okay. What are we doing right and what are we doing badly in Ireland for, to, to encourage entrepreneurship and support startups? Yeah, but everything I say, by the way, is not representative of Trinity and it's not representative of Blackstone either. Just to say that, just in case. No, I, I, I don't think I'm going to say anything else. I don't. I know that's a hard question. I don't. I think we're no. Ireland has a huge name outside of Ireland um, for for innovation and entrepreneurship and early stage seed. We have plenty of early stage seed funding. Um, there's a bit of a gap at the later stage, and I would always advise any startup and the enterprise zone Ireland don't like me when I say this. But once you get your seed funding in Ireland, or go abroad for your seed fund even, you don't have to stay in Ireland. There are pla you know, Ireland is a small community and even the VCs and angel investors will know you. When you go to, we have students this year that didn't apply to Launchbox because they're in Stockholm working. They said, no, we're gonna go to Stockholm for the summer, work on our business there. And they just moved into a co-working space and started just drinking coffee and meeting everybody and there if you're an Irish company abroad you get so much more kudos than you get in Ireland like so um, I think we should encourage that mobility I mean Erasmus universities do this Erasmus mobility program and the Europe Europe is all about moving around Europe London like we're so close to London the biggest capital our second biggest capital market in the world the amount of VC that's floating around there the amount of angel money that's in London that you will meet you go to an event in London tonight and there'll be people there writing checks, literally. You know, that doesn't happen in Ireland. Talk about the team then, how important is diversity? Oh yeah, the, 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 the diversity thing is hugely important and you know, the whole gender diversity is a huge uh, thing that we're so aware of. And I mean, the most successful company we've ever had in Launchbox was, was Isolt, you know, and they were predominantly women. and. Um, in a university, we have to be have to be very aware of it. Where one of our big other challenges is to tar target people across not just STEM, you know, not just science, technology, engineering, and maths, but humanities. Get humanities people because they have a whole different way of critical thinking and art as creative technologies and social entrepreneurship. Like you know, it's all. Food cloud is not for profit, and we have to support social entrepreneurship as a, a huge trend as well. Um, 
Plus, uh, yeah, so what can we do better? So, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, in, in, as a Don't nation. Get out of the goldfish bowl. Like, okay. I think it's related to, a, you know, we are a bit of a goldfish bowl, and people will say, oh, if I don't raise money in Ireland, there's this story you hear people say, oh, if you go to London to raise money or you go to Silicon Valley, they'll ask, well, why haven't you got an Irish VC on board? They don't care. They don't give a shit. If you've got, you know, I think Irish VCs say that to you so to keep you here. Like, VCs want to keep you. They never say no. You know, VCs are very slow to say no because then you go to somebody else. You know, so they kind of try to keep you on board and then they keep you slowly kind of ticking over. Oh, yeah, yeah, come back to us in a week and, or no, come back to us in six months. Go to, go to, go to London for six days and you'll do better, I think, personally. That's my personal opinion. Yeah. But I, and then come back, you know. How, how important is mentorship to young startups? Yeah, the mentor, like the mentorship thing is, it can be quite controversial. I think I would, anybody who says they're a mentor, or calls says they're an expert aren't by default aren't an expert i think you know who could none of these none of these mentors they're all mentors they're an expert in something but like a startup mentor is a tough and like and we do say that you know we try to help but it's more about introducing them to the real mentor you know i think there's a bit of a backlash around there's a lot of mentors like we have a real policy in trinity that we don't pay mentors at all if, so, if some mentor is going to come in and they're looking for payment, even if they're to give a talk, sorry, you know, you're not in it for the right reason. But I guess, as you say, the most serious mentors yeah, don't call themselves mentors, but the yeah. people who've been there and done yeah. it, and you see a lot of them being very generous towards. Yeah, 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 and they want to do it and they see themselves, and yeah. they're the most valuable people if you can get them. And there's, there's loads of them around Limerick, there's loads of them in Ireland. Just before we go to the audience for Q and A, what would you? What would be your top three tips for startups? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a good question. I mean, there's loads of them. I have, yeah. I have this slide listicle of a thing there. I think a really good one, and it was, it was a guy from Limerick that told me, um, make a decision. In you know when you're doing something in a startup, and you're forming your own business make a decision even if it's the wrong decision it's okay the, you know the example he was given if you're painting a wall you know you're looking at all the color what color will look good in that wall at the end just paint the feckin' wall you know <laughs> it might be the wrong color but you have to keep moving as a startup you know Thing, things things evolve uh, so quickly in certain areas like life sciences and things are different but in the whole it sector you just gotta you gotta move don't procrastinate you know yeah. um, um, I think the other thing is respect the salesman in you or the salesperson. We all, if you're in a startup, you have to be a salesperson, obviously. But like when I was studying physics or science or engineering, we didn't we didn't like engineering. We didn't like salespeople. Marketing people were like ooh, nasty liars and fake liars. Yeah, yeah, you know. But you have to respect yeah. the job they do. But you have to respect it in yourself too. And related to that, as a little aside. It's okay, smoke and mirrors kind of demos are okay sometimes. You know, there's certain times you have to, um, you have to be able to show uh, what the product is going to look like, even when you don't have it fully finished. Fake it to make it. Yeah, fake it to make it, you know. And there's balance there. You get caught out if you get, you know, you position it well. And then another thing, again, another thing we're back, back the final one, which is very related to your original question about what I, I think personally Ireland isn't good at, and it's related to this, is respect for design. Design, now not design thinking, I mean, that, that's part of it, but we don't, again, as engineers, we, I've seen so many companies in Trinity out of research that have brilliant technology, and they put it in a radionics box, and it looks crap, and but it's really good, it's hermetically sealed, and it's that is the right box to have it in. I, I, and then there'll be a Scandinavian competitor who has a beautifully designed, and I'm talking about niche stuff, I'm not talking about B to C, I'm talking about you know, uh, enterprise stuff. Actually, this device was, is a device for measuring noise pollution in cities, that every city in Europe over 100,000 has to measure uh, the no average noise over 24 hours, and they put it on traffic lights. So it's only a, it's only a piece of box that goes on traffic lights. But you still, their big competitor sells for 10 times their price. And it's in a bang and all of some type box almost. 
And they were saying their microphones are one euro microphones from China. And their mi our microphones are 50, our microphones are way better. But it's in, it's not in the, it doesn't look as good. And people, you go for design. And uh, Irish culture, I think, goes, we're so good at, it, like, art, creative art, but at kind of the extreme art of, you know, lit literature, poetry. We're brilliant at that, but we need to come back into, like, design. I know Limerick School of Art and Design is fantastic. IADT, you know. The, the, We've some people in the audience from there. Yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, there's, except for the guy who did the comics. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So we can talk about that after a while. If it's controversial, you know, the guy that's yeah. done the comics. I mean, I, it's, it's, it, that's an so design, industrial, good industrial design. Industrial yeah. and web design, like you, user, right. user experience, yeah. CX, that's the other buzzword now. Yeah. It used to be UX, now it's CX, customer experience. I have to drop those into conversations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In a knowledgeable way. 